to be clear, last week we talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How many of y'all came for Resurrection Sunday? Y'all excited about that? We definitely had an overflow. We celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I don't know if you know this, but according to the Bible, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, did you know that he was seen for 40 days? He was seen for 40 days. And the number 40 is very interesting to me because the number 40 represents trials and testing. First of all, the Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. They were tested by God. The first generation didn't believe. The second generation believed, and so they stepped into the promise, meaning you got to believe the words of the Lord over your life. you got to believe what God has spoken over you so you could step into the promise. Too many times, listen, we're believing the lies instead, aren't we? We're believing the conflict. We're believing the doubt in our head. And guess what? That's what you see in life because that's what you believe instead of believing his promises for you. Also with the number 40, we know that Jesus was even tempted by the devil in the wilderness for 40 days, but he did not give in to that temptation. He knew no sin to show us that there always is a way out in the name of Jesus to see freedom in our life, right? So 40 is very interesting to me, but I don't know if you know this, but 40 also represents God's completion, almost a a new beginning. And so after Jesus was seen 40 days after his resurrection, he then teaches his disciples, I need you to do something very important. Now listen, Jesus is also speaking to us today as followers of Christ. Here it is. He said in Acts chapter one, verse eight, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Don't miss that. That means that you're not alone in the life that you're living right now. That means even if other people abandon you right now, the Holy Spirit, the the living Spirit of God is inside of you. And when you need clarity, God will bring you clarity. God will give you direction in your life on what to do and where to go. And then he says, listen, the Holy Spirit's gonna come upon you. And then because of the power of the Holy Spirit, in the Greek is dunamis power, mighty power, you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We know this is the great commission. And we know this is exciting, but imagine the disciples hearing this for the first time. You're telling me to go back to the places where they killed you? That's what the disciples are hearing. Uh, Jesus, uh, I wanna make sure that I heard you correctly. You want us to go back to Jerusalem? Were they yelled crucify? When they came against you, yes, Jesus was saying, I want you to go back to some places you don't want to go to. But you'll be led by my Holy Spirit. And so when you get back there, you're not going to be afraid. You're going to be a changed person. And so the moment you gave your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in you. You can go back to those places you never wanted to go to, and you're a changed person. And now when you see that person you used to have conflict with, the Holy Spirit starts to speak to you. And guess what? He gives you strength. Here it is to forgive. But a lot of us want to put them in their place. But instead, the Holy Spirit says, no, 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 you need to forgive them. Let it go. Give it over to the just judge. He can handle them better than you. And that's freedom for your life. You become a changed person because the Holy Spirit is with you and guiding you. And we see this. But then after Jesus made the statement, something very powerful took place. It says in the Bible that Jesus started to float in the air. Now imagine that. Jesus just said, I want you to go where you don't want to go. Well, come on, come back, Jesus. <laughs> you want me to go there? Let's have a, a deeper conversation about this. Where are you going? And he starts to fly into the air until they could not see him anymore. And what's powerful about this, listen, two angels appeared and two angel, angels revealed to them, hey, as you have seen Jesus go, guess what? He's gonna come back to this earth in the same way. Acts chapter one, verses nine through 11. After saying this, He was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him as they strained to see him rising into heaven. Then two white robed men suddenly stood among them and said, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven, but someday he's gonna return to heaven in the same way you saw him go. So the title of today's message is this, The Return of Jesus. The Return of Jesus, part one. Um, today's gonna be different. I gotta be honest with you. I am, I, I've lost a little bit of sleep last night because I have been studying the word of God so much on this. Whenever I talk about the return of Jesus, it does not matter what I think. All that matters is the word of God. 
And so I want to make sure if I'm preaching up here, I'm just giving you the word of God, what his word says, okay? Because sometimes we hear different theories and think different things because of the way we grew up. And so I want to make it very clear. I've been asking the Holy Spirit to speak through me. So today I'm going to preach a little bit differently. It's going to be more of a lesson today. And I got a lot of scriptures to show you about the return of Jesus Christ. So Adam had to create this in two parts, okay? So today's part one. Next week, Next week will be the night of worship, and then when we come back on the 21st, I'm going to do part two. Today, we're going to talk about signs. What signs that we will see telling us that Jesus is coming back very soon, what's going to happen to this earth, what's going to happen to us, and then when we get to part two, we're going to talk about what we will be doing in heaven while waiting, and then what Jesus will do when he returns. Who's excited to hear that? All right, all right. So anyway, let me say it like this too. Jesus did not just leave us alone in a dark world either. Uh, but he said, I'm coming back, and I'm coming back very soon. So let's go ahead and dive into point number one, which is this. Uh, it's more of a question. What signs will we see then? What signs will we see? And this is a very good question. Even the disciples asked Jesus this question, and they asked Jesus this question on the Mount of Olives. And it's interesting to me because Jesus has just foretold that or predicted that the temple in Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. And so after hearing this, the disciples follow him to the Mount of Olives and they ask him, okay, Jesus, what are the signs then? How will we know that your second coming is about to happen? What's interesting to me is where Jesus is asking this question. Where, is he ask, where are they asking this question? And they're asking Jesus on the Mount of Olives. And according to prophecy out of the book of Zechariah, we know that Jesus is gonna come back and land, listen to this, on the Mount of Olives and split it into two. Zechariah chapter 14, verse four. It states, on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives, listen to this, will split apart, making a wide valley running from east to west. Half the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south, meaning Jesus is going to arrive like the Hulk in Avengers just smashing it into everything's going to be split apart. Okay, that's me. I'm sorry about that. Let me get back to the word of God. All right. But Jesus just arrives in such power and glory that he splits the mountain. So the disciples are asking Jesus, hey, how are you going to return? How are we going to know that you're returning on the Mount of Olives that Jesus will actually split in the future? And so Jesus doesn't answer their question right away, though. Here's what I noticed about Jesus. Instead, he gives them a warning. And he tells his disciples, listen, a lot of things are going to happen after I leave. You're going to hear a lot of people talk, a lot of gossip, a lot of conspiracies are going to take place. And he said, and there's going to be people proclaiming to be the Messiah. Don't be misled. All right, don't be misled by these people claiming to be me when they show up and say, I'm Jesus. Don't believe them. They're going to come with counterfeit signs and wonders. And Jesus was clarifying this so that we're not misled by the world. So we don't live by fear. Uh, just recently, I found out today that uh, I don't know where the area was, but a guy broke into Pizza Hut. I don't know if you've heard the story. He broke into Pizza Hut and stole a pizza and called 911 on himself. And they said, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus Christ. And I just wanted some pizza and broke into a Pizza Hut. And the more they had a conversation with him, he just said he was mad at Judas and wanted some pizza. We live in a crazy world, right? Some of us are like, please, Jesus, take me now, all right? I'm about to punch somebody. Please get me out of here. So Jesus was saying, don't be misled, okay, by certain things. Now, listen, at the same time, he's also instructing his disciples and us as believers today, you will recognize the signs. You're gonna recognize that my coming is very close. You're gonna recognize that there are things happening in the world, and so you will recognize the season is very close for my return. Matthew 24, verses four through seven. Jesus told them, don't, be, uh, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Again, Jesus is stating to the disciples and us, don't live like the world lives. When the world is stressing out and they don't know what to do, guess what? What do you need to do? Right? Go to the altar. Go to the Lord and ask the Lord to give you hope. When the world is living in fear and everybody's stressed out and they're just getting things right now because they're preparing for the worst, what do you need to do? You need to prepare in the word of God. 
What does the word of God say? What is his presence? Because in his presence, you receive peace. And guess what? Throughout the entire Bible, did you know that God always warns his people? He's always sharing what's about to happen, what his plans are, and he even reveals what the enemy's plans are. Mary and Joseph, they didn't know how to take care of the son of God, but God revealed to them in a dream, hey, you need to get out of here and go to Egypt because Herod is trying to kill the son of God, trying to kill Jesus. When they went to Egypt, God also gave them another dream to come back and to safety. We see it out of the Old Testament that God would reveal to his prophets, hey, a dream or vision or revelation of judgment that was coming over and over again. God was revealing to his people. So when the world is in a panic, guess what? You can trust the Lord. You can receive clarity, and that's why it's so good that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, because he speaks to us and tells us what is coming. But when the world has no hope, listen, you have hope in Jesus Christ. You have hope in him. So we should not live in fear is what Jesus was saying. Don't live like the rest of the world. That nation will go against nation and kingdoms against kingdoms. There will be famines and there will be earthquakes in many parts of the world. World, But then he gives us this revelation in verse eight. But then he says, this is only the first of the birth pangs with more to come. The first of the birth pangs. Now, the wording here is very interesting because the Bible is also very clear. The closer we get to the end days, the closer we get to the second coming of Christ, guess what? Those birth pains are going to intensify. They're gonna become more consistent, intensify, and the world will know, hey, Jesus is coming back. It's all happening at once, over and over and over again. This is happening, that's happening all over the world. And what is God doing? He's giving birth to judgment upon evil in this world. That's the second coming of Christ. His wrath upon the evil of this world, the wickedness of the world, the wickedness of the devil and his demons. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. And and, in chapter 5, Paul is talking about the second coming of Christ. In chapter 4, Paul talks about the rapture of the church. But here's what he says in in chapter 5, verse 2 and 3. He says, For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly. Okay, and anytime you see the day of the Lord, it usually is in reference of God's judgment and wrath upon the evil of this world. So the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them. Like a thief means nobody knows the day or the hour. And Jesus also warned his disciples, many will mislead. And we know from every generation, there's that one person that says, I know the day and the hour. I know exactly the time. No, you're just loony, okay? Like, I'm not listening to you. Don't sell your stuff. You're okay. Rely on God, not a person saying they know the day or the hour. Because Jesus said, nobody knows the day or the hour. But again, we can recognize the season. We can recognize the times. But when these people say everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them. Look at the wording here. As suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. What if I just ended right there? How many of y'all would say, I don't know what to think about that service. (laughs) Is that good news like for us? Is that that bad news? Because they just said, you know, the wrath of God is coming. Disaster is gonna fall on them and there's gonna be no escape. And a lot of us run away from the book of Revelation. We run away from prophecy because we don't understand it and we get scared. So let me clarify. Paul is not talking about believers in Jesus Christ. He's talking about the wicked. He's talking about those that are living for the world, not living for Jesus, those that have rejected Jesus and accepted the world and the devil and have worshiped the idol of the beast as well. And we'll get into that a little later on in this sermon. This is not judgment on believers. This is judgment on the wicked. Those that have rejected Jesus Christ. How do we know? Keep reading. Verses four through nine. But then he says, listen to this but you aren't in the dark about these things. You're not in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters. So you're not gonna be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. Again, you don't know the day or the hour, but you recognize it's coming close, I'm ready. For you, listen to what he said here, you are children of light. End of the day, we don't belong to the darkness and night. So then he gives us guidance here. He says, be on guard. Not asleep like others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. 
What is he saying here? He's saying you need to guard your heart. You need to guard your eyes. You need to guard your ears. What are you listening to? What are you feeding on? Last week we talked about Jesus and the Lord's Supper saying that we need to be consumed by his word, consumed by his presence. If you're not consumed by Jesus, you're consumed by the devil. Is that clear? If you're not consumed by the word of God, you're consumed by the world. You're consumed by everything else on your social media account. When you scroll, again, you're scrolling a feed. You're feeding on the agendas of the world. And some of us today are feeding on insecurities, anxiety, and stress, and panic. And we're looking at all these things, but we're not coming to God. How is it that we run more to social media than we are to Jesus? He's saying, you're not like the rest of the world. Why are you living like them? Why aren't you guarding your heart? It's precious to the Lord. Because what you allow in will break it. What you allow in can hurt it. And a lot of us have been there. And guess what? When we get hurt, you know what we say? Well, I can never go back to church. Or, or I don't believe in relationships because every relationship I've been in has just been damaged and hurt. You're allowing the wrong people into your life. You're believing the lies of the enemy. You're not guarding yourself and you're going out. You're doing all these things. You're getting drunk every night and you don't even see the signs. That's what he's saying. The world won't see it. They'll be blind. And maybe right now you have a friend and you're trying to talk to that friend about Jesus and they're like, I don't want to hear that. They don't see it. And it's crazy. And you just want to be like, have you seen what's happening in the world today? You see what's happening? Today? How do you not see this? what he's talking about. We're not supposed to live like them. We got to guard our hearts. So be clear headed. Now, when we're clear headed, listen to this, we're protected by the armor of faith and love. I can move by faith because I know that God loves me. I know that he is here. And then we have a helmet of confidence in our salvation. I have confidence and hope that when Jesus comes back, I'm going to be okay. This is a promised hope. The believers were excited about this. Are you? That's my question. The early church was like, please, Jesus, come back. When are you coming back? But a lot of us Christians today are like, I'm not ready. I haven't gotten married yet. I don't have children. And I get it. You got goals. You got things you want to experience. But the reason you were created is to know him. Your whole purpose is to know him. And there's going to be good things in your life and their blessings from the Lord, but they will not fulfill you like a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we'll get into that. We'll we'll talk about revelation a little bit and what we'll do before the throne of God. But here's how we know that the wrath is not for us. Listen to this. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out, here it is, not to pour out his anger on us, us, not to pour out his wrath on us, right? His judgment on us as believers in Christ because of what Jesus did upon the cross. We have been sanctified. We have been redeemed. Hallelujah. Because we don't deserve it. None of us do. And when you understand that, you understand the grace of God that every time you rebelled against him, he still called you by your name. Every time you said, Jesus, I just want to do my own thing. He said, all right, it's going to break my heart, but I'll be here with my arms open to take you back in. This is what he did for us upon the cross. And so I do believe a lot of you right now, you're at the crossroads in different stages of life. Some of you are younger and you're probably thinking, okay, when I'm older, I'll live for Jesus. That's a lie of the devil. You're not promised tomorrow. Some of us are thinking that, okay, I'm just, I'm okay where I am. I serve, I serve, I do this, I do that. But yet you never talk to Jesus. You don't really pursue a relationship with him. You just kind of show up and do the thing and check it off your list. And and God wants more from you. He wants a relationship with you. And so I'm going to show you some signs that are taking place today. Just to grab your attention of how much we need Jesus and how quickly he could return. The first sign I want to talk about is we always have to look at what's happening in Israel. In Israel. Israel is at war. Uh, They have been at war since October since the massacre took place in Israel, the horrific massacre. And I have a friend right now that's in Tel Aviv. And he was telling me that we need to be on the lookout and and pray for Israel. Because right now he said that Russia is on Israel's border. And, And then he also said that Iran is planning to attack. 
So they are preparing right now for a major strike from Iran. If you haven't heard, recently Israel was able to strike Damascus. They are just waiting for Iran to attack. They are on high alert at this moment. And so when I hear Russia, Russia and Iran, I automatically think of something that's also prophetic in the book of Ezekiel that's called the Gog Magog War. And this is not gonna be on the screen. I kind of have some added notes today that I wanna share with you guys. But in Ezekiel chapter 38, it says in verse five that Persia, and Persia is ancient Iran. So Iran is Persia. So Persia, Iran, Cush, Ethiopia, and put Libya, North Africa with them, all of them with the shield of the helmet, will come against Israel. And then it also says that many troops uh, are parts of the north. And this is why many commentators believe that Russia will also be in an alliance with them. Verse eight says, and again, it's not on the screen. You could just listen to this. After many days, you will be summoned in service. But in the latter years, okay, you shall come into the land that is restored from the ravages of the sword where people have been gathered out of many nations to the mountains of Israel which have been a continual wasteland, but its people were brought out of the nations and now they're living securely, all, all of them right there, and you will go up against them and will strike them like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering in the land and all of your troops and many people with you, and you will devise an evil plan against the nation of Israel. Right now, we're seeing these things stir up. And they seem to be escalating more and more. And listen, as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to be praying for the nation of Israel, okay? And I'm gonna show you why in a second. We're also praying for everybody around the area that is involved, okay? That is, that is hurt from this, that has want, wants nothing to do with the war, that's just innocent in the conflict. We're praying for everybody that, that needs prayer, especially because there's many believers in that area as well, on both sides. But here's what we know according to the word of God that they will try to come and attack Israel and attack Jerusalem. Let me ask you this question. Who's gonna save Israel? Israel's not gonna save Israel. Their weapons aren't gonna save Israel. Listen, Jesus is gonna come back and save Jerusalem. Save Israel. How do we know this? Zechariah chapter 14, verses one through four. Watch, for the day of the Lord is coming. And again, when you see the day of the Lord, this is talking about the judgment, the wrath of God coming when your possessions will be plundered right in front of you. I will gather all nations to fight against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the house looted, and the women raped. Half the population will be taken into captivity and the rest will be left among the ruins of the city. And when it feels like there's no hope left, look at this prophecy right here. Then the Lord will go out and fight for them. The Lord Jesus Christ will go out and fight against those nations as he has fought in times past. On that day, his feet will stand, oh, we've heard this, on the Mount of Olives of Jerusalem. And that's when he shows up and he splits the Mount of Olives into two. And here's the great thing about this. When Jesus shows up, guess what? There's gonna be a revival in the land. Because the prophecy also tells us that the Jews will realize they crucified their Messiah our Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it actually says that they will repent and they will mourn over what they have done. And they will come to Jesus. There will be a revival the moment Jesus shows up. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Then I will pour out a spirit of grace and prayer on the family of David and all the people of Jerusalem. And they will look on me whom they have pierced and mourned. They will mourn because they will realize that they crucified their Savior, their Messiah. They will mourn for him as for an only son. The Jews will turn to Jesus. They will mourn because they crucified the Messiah. And then the Bible tells us due to this prophecy, they will repent and come to Jesus. And another very interesting thing is out of the book of Revelation, it tells us that 144,000 Jews will convert to Christianity during the times of tribulation and they're gonna present the gospel during the seven years of tribulation and many will keep believing in Jesus Christ. See, God is always showing us his saving grace. Isn't it amazing here that even at this moment, those that did not believe in Jesus, Jesus showed up where they were to protect them, to say, this is my city, this is my people. God always meets us where we are. 
It doesn't matter how far you've been from the Lord. He will meet you where you are. All you have to do is call upon the name of Jesus. And when you repent, the enemy is taken down. Your family is changed. Your life is changed. But we see this. This is a sign. Another sign is this. Now, this one may raise an eyebrow, uh, but I've been preaching this for a very long time, okay? And I'm gonna show you what I mean by this. But AI, artificial intelligence, is leading us closer to the beast system. That we see out of the book of Revelation. I don't know if you've been paying attention to AI and how much it has changed over the last few years. What used to be kind of comical is now scary today. Um, artificial intelligence, what they could do if they wanted to, they could... Um, create a video of me, a video of me uh, saying a joke or something I've never said and make it look exactly like I said it. They could mimic my voice, mimic my talent. They can mimic artists. They can create music and say it was from this artist. It's crazy. I don't know if you've ever heard of something called deep fake um, where they take people and it's not real. None of it's real, but it looks real. It looks like they said it. it looks like they were there, but it never happened. And so we're getting to a point where it's hard to tell what is real and what is fake. And so what we're seeing right now in the community of AI and how it's, it's almost getting its own personality. Um, it can copy human behavior, mimic voices, mimic talents, and we're getting to a point where it can even create without human input, which is extremely scary. Hasn't all the movies like warned us about this thing? You know, um, The reason though I have preached on this for the last few years to be honest with you, is because of what we see out of the book of Revelation chapter 13. And in Revelation chapter 13, we see that the Antichrist has the power to bring an idol, a statue to life. And this statue will actually speak and breathe and kill those that do not worship it. Something like we've never seen before in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 and 15. It says, oh, the Antichrist here is possessed by Satan, and it says that he did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky. Let me make this also very clear. The Bible says that Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet are all counterfeits. So everything that the enemy tries to do is a counterfeit of what God does. Why is he bringing fire from heaven? Well, if you know, during the days of tribulation, we'll talk about this in part two, there were two witnesses of God that shows up. And it says that when people came against them, when their enemies came against them, these two witnesses of God were able to, uh, I think, breathe fire against them and kill them. And so here we see Satan try to mimic that power. Oh, look, I can do it too. I can do it too. And so they make fire flash down to earth from the sky, but it's not the same. While everyone was watching and with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, listen to this, he deceived all the people who belong to the world. So all those that believe the lies of the devil have rejected Jesus. And then he ordered, listen to this, he ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. Then, here it is. He was permitted to give life to the statue so that it could speak. Notice the wording there. That's very different from anything else we see out of the Old Testament or the New Testament. Then the statue of the beast commanded. So the statue here, the idol of the beast is actually speaking and commanding people to worship it. And if you do not worship the idol of the beast, guess what? You are going to die. And some translations state that the Antichrist was able to put breath into this idol. This idol was coming to life. So many commentators believe, okay, definitely this is supernatural. But at the same time, it could be because of AI technology. Because we're seeing this today. We're leading this way right now. And we're going to be talking about a few other things like the mark of the beast in a minute, okay? But this is a different kind of idol that we see. Um, let me just show you. In the Old Testament, the prophets would make fun of these idols because they weren't living, they weren't breathing, and they couldn't speak. Psalm chapter 135, verse 15 and 17. The idols of the nations are merely things of silver and gold shaped by human hands. They have mouths, but guess what? They cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. And they have mouths, but they cannot breathe. So something shifted Something changed. Again, it's a counterfeit miracle. The devil is trying to copy God. Let me see that here. But the reason I want to make you aware of this is because we're living in a time, listen, 
Well, we're depending more on AI and more on asking questions to AI than we're asking God. If you were to look up your Google search, how many times are you asking Google more than you're asking Jesus? And I get it. There's things you need to search and look up and ask questions over. But have you realized that we become dependent upon these things? We become dependent on these things in our life. We rely on them. And if we don't have them, if we don't have your phone, what are you going to do? Is it a bad day? Everything messes up? Why? Because we become so dependent on these things. Eventually, we're going to get to a time where these things come to life as an idol of the beast, demanding people to worship it. It's all leading to the beast system. I gotta show you one more thing, though. Okay, and this is back in Matthew chapter 24. So again, the disciples come up to Jesus on the Mount of Olives, and they said, Jesus, what is the sign of your second coming? Jesus said, it's not so much the wars or rumors about wars, but then he said, listen, once you see the abomination of desolation, know that I'm coming back soon. And some of you are like, oh, that's exciting. What is that? <laughs> what, is, what is the abomination of desolation? Okay, abomination means disgusting, horrific, um, hatred. Desolation means total destruction, total emptiness. And what he's saying here is prophesied by Daniel. I'll go over that in a second. But Jesus is stating when the Antichrist sets himself up in the Holy of Holies, because there will be a third temple that we will be rebuilt. When he sets himself up in the Holy of Holies, he may also put this idol here that came to life, telling people to worship it. And it will be so horrific and disgusting that he will kill those who do not worship the idol. This is the abomination of desolation. That's what Jesus was speaking about. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 and 16. He said, but listen, when you witness what Daniel prophesied, and here it says the disgusting destroyer, this is the abomination of desolation, taking its stand in the holy place. Let the reader learn, then those in the land of Judah, you need to escape to higher ground. It's about to get worse. It's about to get really bad for the Jews living in that time, for the people that did not believe in Jesus. Why? Verse 21 and 22, for this will be a time of great misery beyond the magnitude of anything the world has ever seen or ever will see. Listen, listen to the wording there. I mean, so many horrific things have happened since the beginning of time. We're even talking about Noah's flood here was a horrific thing, a, a very scary thing. And right here, Jesus is saying, but this is gonna be worse than any of that. It's gonna be like a time nobody's ever seen before. Crazy. And then he said, and, and please notice this, we, we get scared sometimes when we read these things. We miss God's grace. We miss his love. So he says all these things, but he also says, unless God limited those days, no one would escape. But because of his love, for those chosen to be his, he will shorten that time of trouble. Um, when is this gonna happen then? The abomination of desolation. Well, it's believed to be mid-trip. And the reason why I don't have this on the screen as well, but in Revelation chapter 13, verse five, you can write that in your notes. It says that the beast was able to speak blasphemies against God for 42 months. That's three and a half more years. So this is the second half of tribulation all the way to the end of tribulation. We know according to the book of Daniel too, there's gonna be seven years of tribulation altogether. So there's gonna be peace at first. The Antichrist comes in pretending to be the false hope of everybody. And then there's gonna be the abomination of desolation and then the war of, of Armageddon. Jesus comes back and defeats him at the very end of tribulation. So this happens mid-trib. Jesus is saying, listen, when you see this happen, when this takes place in the middle of tribulation, that's how you know that I'm coming back very soon. What did Daniel say though? Because Jesus said Daniel prophesied about this. I don't, I, I don't have time to go over everything that Daniel spoke, but let me just show you this. Daniel 11, 37, 38. Okay, and here he's talking about the Antichrist. He says the king, but he's talking about the Antichrist will not respect the gods of his ancestors, the God worshiped by women, not any God, um, not any other God, because he will consider himself to be the greatest God of all. What Daniel meant by that is when the Antichrist sets up his throne, he will abolish and get rid of every religion in the world. And he will say only he can be worshiped. He wants a universal, uh, he wants all people to worship him. 
one universal religion to worship the antichrist, the beast, the idol of the beast. That's what he's trying to do here. But he also stated instead, he will glorify the God of strongholds and he will honor this God unknown to his ancestors. So again, this is why commentators believe this may have something to do with AI, something that nobody's ever seen before, with gold and silver, precious stone and costly gifts. So he sets up the idol of the beast and the holy of holies. And then Jesus says, when that happens, I'm coming back soon and the world will know. See, why did Jesus say, don't be misled? Because he made it very clear. Listen, a lot of people are gonna say that they're Jesus, that they're me, that they're the Messiah, that they just came. Listen, when Jesus comes back, the whole world will see it. You understand that in the scripture, right? Like it's gonna be a cosmic thing. The heavens are gonna shake. It's gonna be scary when Jesus comes back for all the unbelievers and those that have lived in wickedness against God. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 27 and 28, it states, the appearing of the son of man will burst forth with the brightness of lightning shining from the eastern sky to the west. Then he said, how do birds of prey know where a dead body is? They just know instinctively. So you will know when I appear, when Christ's return, it will be be visible to the entire world and terrify the wicked, terrify those that have rejected Jesus Christ. The third sign though is this, and we're getting closer and closer to this. It's a one world currency, one world currency. Um, Revelation chapter 13, 16 and 17. He required everyone small and great rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And no one, listen to the wording here, no one could buy, no one could sell anything without that mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing the beast. For the longest time, this has been preached for generation to generation. It's been hard to imagine until recently. Because we all know in 2020, Overnight, it seemed like uh, a lot of businesses didn't accept cash anymore. We quickly almost became a cashless society. Everybody just wanted debit cards and moving forward with that. And so all it took was one thing to take place for cash to be um, out and be done with. And, And I shared this about a year ago as well. This is nothing new. Go ahead and show this picture. Uh... They've been experimenting with this for a long time when it comes to putting a chip in your hand and being able to buy things. And you gotta realize like the way they're gonna sell it is this. For those that are unbelievers and don't know the word of God, they're gonna say, hey, listen, you could be like a superhero, pretty much. You can just go into a store. uh, You can buy whatever you want to. You don't even have to go to a cash register. Don't waste your time in the lines. Just go ahead and just walk out. It will scan your body, scan your hands, scan your forehead, and and it already takes it out of of your bank account. Just like that. About a year ago, uh, Amazon released the palm payment technology. And I don't know if you guys saw this go viral on TikTok or social media, um, but they placed it, according to this right here, they placed it in over 500 Whole Foods market stores. And so now in Whole Foods, if you want to, when you're about to buy your products, buy your food, you just scan your hand. You realize how much things have changed how quickly these things have progressed, how quickly we are getting to the time of Jesus' return and the rapture of the church. We are getting closer and closer and closer. The things that used to be hard to imagine are just happening right before us. And the the Bible says the world will know, the world will see it. And it spoke that way before social media came out, way before people were able to share these things and show these things. But this is already here and it's just gonna progress until we get into the days of tribulation. Now, all right, I'm gonna show you one more thing, okay? And I gotta be honest with you. Uh, my wife knows a lot more about this subject than I do, but I told her I would, I would share it today. In Israel right now, I think there are three, yeah, there are three very rare red heifers. Some of you have heard this, I could tell, and some of you are like, oh, what does cows have to do with Jesus returning? Um, it's been a very interesting story And according to CBS News, part of the reason for the war right now with Hamas is because of these red heifers. See, the Jews brought in three red heifers. I'm gonna share with you how rare this is. Just one red heifer. But they have three red heifers right now in Israel. 
And the reason they have them is because they're gonna offer them over to the Lord as a purification ceremony, listen, so they can build a third temple. That's happening right now. And last I heard, I don't know if this is gonna happen or not, last I heard, um, they could offer them to the Lord on April 10th. I don't know though. I'm, I'm not sure on that, but that's the last I heard. But where did they get this? Numbers chapter 19, verse two. It says, tell the people of Israel to bring a red heifer, a perfect animal that has no defects and has never been yoked to a plow. This is very rare and hard to find. This means that the, the cow must be completely red, no spots, no defects. Guess what? They don't understand this. It represents Jesus Christ. His blood shed for us. In fact, uh, there are two things that I've heard. CBS News says that they've already built an altar where they're gonna sacrifice this over to the Lord. But I've also heard other people say, no, they're not gonna do it on an altar. They're actually gonna bring the red heifer on the Mount of Olives and offer it to the Lord right there. And this is all coming up, okay? Uh, not only can it not have any spots or any blemishes, uh, it must not be used for labor. It can never be pregnant. It must be three to four years old. This is so rare to find that the last time they found this was in 1996. They thought they found one and it had a defect. So they weren't able to use it. And the last time they were able to do this was over 2000 years ago. You know, right before Rome destroyed the temple. That's the last time they were able to do this. And right now they have three red heifers in Israel. Crazy. Things are happening. So my question for you today is, and I told you today's sermon is gonna be a little bit different. How does it make you feel? Where are you at right now? And again, some of you are like, all right, I'm ready for Jesus to take me out of here. I'm tired of this world. I'm tired of looking at my pantry and seeing no food. I'm ready to eat in the kingdom of God, right? But some of you are scared. Some of you feel confused because you know you've been running from Jesus. And so I'm not speaking these things to scare you or to condemn you. I'm showing you God's grace and his love and his mercy. He's allowing you to hear what's coming so you can run to him before it does. He's allowing you to hear the judgment and wrath that has to come upon evil for us to be in the kingdom of God with no tears and no pain and no hurting on the inside. That means the devil and his demons and all the wicked have to leave. It means that he has to be a just judge. That's what makes him so good. God, handle my enemies. God, handle those who hurt me. You know the healing of that. You prayed that prayer before. God, they hurt me. They said such bad things about me. They came against me. They gossiped about me. And it feels like they're getting away with it. But Lord, I know that you will take care of them. And I pray for them, Lord. But I can't take revenge. That doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. God is coming back not to take revenge on you, but to take revenge on the devil for what he's done. But listen, you got a choice. And you're either going to trust Jesus or you're going to trust the devil. So how are you feeling? Today, you can give your life over to the Lord. I got one more thing to share with you. My last point is this, okay? When Jesus comes back to this earth in his glory, guess what? We will be with him. When Jesus comes back in his glory, we come back with him. What's that look like? Matthew 24, 29 through 30. Jesus also said immediately after the anguish, after the tribulation of those days, when the tribulation time is done at the very end, guess what? Then the sun will be darkened and the moon will give no light the stars, the sun of this, will fall from heaven, will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens. And there will be deep mourning among other peoples of the earth. Why would it say that? I mean, if we're seeing Jesus come back in his second coming, wouldn't we be excited? We're about to get there. It's because we've already been raptured. And those seeing Jesus come back are not living for Jesus. They're living for the world and they know their time is up. They know they've been following the devil, following his lies, and they know, okay, judgment is now coming. That's why they are mourning. That's why you don't see anybody uh, leaping for joy in this and praising God. And it says that they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I also wanna read this as well. Revelation chapter six, verse 12 through 14. I watched as the lamb broke the sixth seal. 
and there was a great earthquake. The sun became, a dark, uh, uh, became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs. Falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind, the sky was rolled up like a scroll and all the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Can you imagine this? This cosmic disaster that's taking place upon the world. The heavens are being shaken up. Things are falling. So what happens to us? As believers, as Christians, where are we gonna be? Okay, and again, and I know many Christians debate this topic, but from my study over and over again, what I see in the word of God, I truly believe that the church, as believers in Jesus, we will be raptured before tribulation begins. I wanna share a few reasons why. First of all, the Bible says the church is the restrainer. This is good news. You know what that means? It means we have power over the devil. The church has power over the devil. It means that we're actually restraining the devil from completing his plans on this earth. We're restraining the Antichrist from being revealed because the devil knows if the Antichrist is revealed, the church is gonna stand up. I know who that is. And it's a lie. These are counterfeit wonders and signs. They're not really from God. Second Thessalonians chapter two, seven and eight. For the mystery of the lawlessness is already at work, meaning there's already evil happening and working in this world. But only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is he? He is the Holy Spirit working through the church. Because Jesus said, listen, you're not alone. I'm gonna put my spirit in you. Holy Spirit's gonna come in you. You're gonna change the earth. You're gonna change people upon the world. They're gonna give their lives over to you. The gospel's gonna be reached. The devil cannot stop you. You know what else Jesus said? He said to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not be able to conquer it. It's amazing. That's the power the church has. That's the power you have as a believer in Jesus. You can see the devil coming and crush his head. I'm not scared of the enemy anymore. But you also see why it's so demonic in our culture today of people completely leaving the church and saying, I could be with Jesus, but I'd never need the church. And we see that a lot. And I get it. Church hurt is real and it, it takes place. But listen, you also understand, according to this, it's the devil's strategy because if he can get the church out of the way in a different way, he can go ahead and move forward with his plans. Jesus made it very clear. It's the church that's standing in the devil's way. It's the church restraining the devil and the antichrist from coming forward. We have the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus is with us. And again, you may have had a bad experience at a church. And I get it's real. But that doesn't mean that God isn't using his church. And and I'm praying right now that more preachers become more bold. And this time with our culture, we got to stand up. We got to speak out the truth. And yes, it may offend at first, but that's okay because I would rather be offended and then set free from something instead of pretending like it's okay and be in bondage of something the rest of your life. Jesus is always saying something that offends our flesh. I said it like this before, our flesh is like a crazy ex, right? Uh, It won't leave and sometimes it wants to take control of us, but we gotta leave our flesh. You gotta say, I'm done with that relationship and I'm pursuing Jesus completely. Um, another reason is this, so we're not appointed for wrath. First Thessalonians 5, 9, for God did not appoint us to wrath as believers, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Noah was saved from the wrath of the flood. Lot was saved from the wrath of Sodom and Gomorrah. We see this over and over again. Again, God was in dreams and visions to his people, listening to his word. They were always saved from judgment and wrath. Remember Abraham's conversation with God? God, if there's just one person that's willing to follow you, will you save them? God always saves his people from wrath because again, wrath is not destined for you, but the enemy, for the devil. So how are we saved? We're raptured into heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we who are alive and remain on the earth, listen to this, we'll be caught up. And the word right here in Greek actually means raptured, caught up, snatched, violently snatched. Together with them, the resurrected ones in the clouds. So we meet Jesus in the air. 
Now listen to the last verse here. So we will always be with the Lord. We'll always be with him. So when judgment comes, guess what? Who you with? You're with Jesus. When everything's starting to crash around, that's okay, because you're with Jesus. Jesus is with you. You are in his presence. That's why he said, be consumed by me and everything about me. And guess what we, what we will be doing before uh, the second coming? After the rapture, let me give you a little preview of part two. Revelation 7, 9, and 10, John saw this future vision of heaven. He said, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches. That sound familiar? Just like Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a donkey. But remember when I taught that, I said he was declaring peace. When Jesus comes back, this time it's declaring victory because he's coming on a white horse for battle. But listen, in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar. There was a thundering sound in the kingdom of heaven because people were worshiping Jesus with everything they had. Sometimes we hold back. They didn't. So a great roar and salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the lamb. And then, listen to this, our king makes war on the devil. Revelation 19, 11, then I saw heaven opened and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. And when Jesus comes back, guess what? We come back with him, sharing in his glory. Jude chapter 1, 14 and 15. Listen, the Lord is coming with countless thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on the people of the world. Colossians chapter three, verse four. When Christ, who is our life, appears, listen to this, then you also will appear with him in glory, in his glory. Meaning we're not just gonna see his glory, but we'll appear with him in his glory. And some of you are thinking, okay, so we're in the army of the Lord. How are we gonna fight? <laughs> I've never fought somebody before. Are we gonna have weapons? Are we gonna have angelic we weapons or something like that? Listen, you won't need a weapon. Let me show you your only weapon. You ready for this? I love this. Revelation 19, 14 and 15. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen followed him on the white horse and from his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. We didn't need a weapon because we got Jesus. And all we had to do, up, do was show up and speak. And from his mouth, the nations fell. From his words, the devil fell. From his word, this idol of the beast that everybody was scared of starts to crumble and fall. From his word, demons have to leave. By his word, those that have rejected Jesus and followed the devil will mourn because they know judgment is coming. Because all evil will be gone. It's our blessed hope. In fact, the first century church called it that. They said it's our blessed hope. They weren't scared of the rapture or the second coming of Jesus. They said, I can't wait for it. And we are living in a time where, hey, the next prophetic fulfillment, guess what, is the rapture of the church. Because the technology is here for the things that we see out of the book of Revelation. There are signs happening right now but again, I want to ask you, where's your relationship with Jesus? Because that's all that matters. And he wants to protect you. And he wants you to have joy right now when the, wor when the world's in chaos, to have a peace and a hope. Yeah, he's coming back. And for the first time, I can say I'm ready. Maybe that's you today. For the first time, you can say I'm ready. I used to be scared because I didn't understand. Or I used to run away from this, I didn't wanna talk about it, but now I realize how evil this world can be, how many people try to crush my heart. When I reach my goals, they didn't fulfill me. I realize that it's only by Jesus I can be saved. And I'm not scared anymore, but I'm excited for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm gonna have you stand up right here. 
And again, this is just part one. I knew today would be different. My message would sound different from the usual. But I just, I pray that the words of the Lord spoke to your heart today. That you don't have to run anymore. That you don't have to be fearful or worried. And so let me ask you this question right now. Are you scared? Are you running? And you're like, Pastor, I need prayer. I need, I need that peace. I need that hope. I need that joy that you speak about. Will you just boldly raise your hand right now if that's you today? Come on. Come on. Be real with the Lord. He sees. The truth is you can fool people, but you can't fool God. He sees. God, I pray, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, over those that have fear and anxiety and stress, but they're ready to know you on a deeper level. They're ready to pursue you in a new way. God, I pray, Lord, over them right now in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, and let a peace and a joy come from your Holy Spirit and bring them clarity. And if there's somebody in this room and you've never accepted Jesus, you've never submitted your life over to Jesus as Lord over your life, meaning that you're submitting to his will. Whatever God has for you, you believe it. You want to do it. And you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, but you've never spoken it out to the Lord. It's time to stop running. I want us all to pray this prayer together and honor the person praying for the first time. But listen, if you prayed this today for the first time, don't just leave. Don't just go away, but reach out to a crew leader. It is time to come to Jesus. Let us pray this. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. Forgive me of my sins and lead me by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, if you enjoyed today's sermon and would like to be part of Authentic Church, go ahead and take the next step and sign up for our next steps online. You can live anywhere in the world and still be part of Authentic Church. Also, I want to say thank you so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to either subscribe or follow to any of our social media accounts so that you can see any new content that will be uploaded. And if you'd like to give to this church to help us financially, go ahead and click that Give button down below to help us reach more people for Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again very soon.